last week. And that's where we were. Okay. All right, Senator. Um, I, I believe that's true, but I believe I fairly well wrapped up everything okay. I had to say. And uh, I know that there's, I, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but I think I've wrapped up what I have to say. And I think okay. that. The state's attorneys and sheriffs have some proposals, and probably right. um, everybody else. I wanted to. The, there is a letter. I don't know if it's in our file. I did read it from um, AJ Lubin regarding the testimony from Butler Boss. Um, so I don't know if you want to. Did you get copies? Did you send that to Peggy? Peggy, do you have copies of the letter from uh, Peggy's outside? I guess I'm talking to the wall. Which has been what I've been doing lately. All right. So getting back on track. Peggy, there was a, a letter to the committee from A.J. Rubin. Oh, yeah. I did not print that out. Would you print that out to sure. the committee and then at some point to figure out? Yeah. Okay. okay. I hope it's your hope. Oh, oh, not house No, no, no. Just house numbers keep you forever. No, no, no. This is just here. They, there is no rush. They really are. I was up in House Commerce and she asked me, you know, whether or not it was on that Uber bill. And she said, well, if you consulted with Encoils. What? <laughs> that one year representative from Brattleboro there. Representative Strong. What's her name? The one from oh, Val Stewart? Val Stewart yeah. asked me if I consulted with anyone. I was like, huh? <laughs> when do I consult? When's end coil? Their end coil are the uh, insurance, insurance people. people. Yeah, but Judy, Judy Milky and Ann Cummings love Kathy Keenan. Well, sure, they like going to their friends, but they're yeah. supported by the coping. End coil is? Yeah. End coil is? Oh. Yeah. Good morning. All right. I found out that I probably won't get any money from them well, this campaign. I'm so bummed out. The culprit? Yeah. I was counting on it. Probably not getting money from a lot of groups. I wouldn't mind a chunk. All right, Chloe well, Wayne, <laughs> the policy director of ACLU is next. No, I, oh. Uh, she's already been there. Yeah. <laughs> James <laughs> Pepper and David Schur from the Attorney General and State Attorney's Office have some suggested language. <laughs> All right, so actually I was just going by the agenda. I'm sorry. So I brought a proposed amendment, uh, oh, folks. Great. And Thank you. Um, the Attorney General's Office and I. Um, There's the whole pile. Okay. Keep one for yourself. All right. <laughs> Um, I guess I should say for the record, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and um, the State's Attorneys and I, or the Attorney General and I sat down and reviewed the latest draft and kind of found some areas where we agree and some areas where we don't. And so I tried in my proposal, you'll see that there's... I don't know why this morning I'm having trouble. You sat down with the Attorney General, not the Defender General. Sorry, the Attorney General, yes. Attorney I may have, I probably. I got the wrong general. Yeah. Okay. I, I, well, I was thinking of the Defender General. You sat down with the Attorney General and came up with some agreement. I should say the Attorney General's office. Attorney General. Well, we call him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, what you'll see in my proposal, and I'll go through them step by step, but uh, some yellow sections. And those are the areas where we agree, I believe. And if I, if I miss, misspeak, uh, Dave Cheryl will let me know. Um, and then some green sections, and those are the areas where we disagree. Um, and who's in favor of the greens? Uh, those are the state's attorney's positions. Right. So, um, so I'm. So I guess moving to um, page two, the first highlighted section. This reinstates um, bail for expungement eligible misdemeanors. Um, we believe that that's important, um, particularly uh, just kind of for the administration of the court and issuing warrants. Um, the 
attorney general is not opposed to that. Uh, I think he would like it lower than $1,000, but we think some reasonable amount, like $1,000, um, you know, keeping in mind that that amount would be at the court's discretion, um, that any portion of that could be a secured portion, the rest unsecured, and, um, you know, just one thing to keep in mind, we did hear testimony in the House that, you know, after hours, a bail bondsman's not going to come out and bail someone out for $200. Um, it's just too low of an amount. Um, can, you, can, you, excuse me, can you just go back to who are the green? The, the green are the state's attorneys. The yellow is... Okay, but I thought you just said the, the attorney general wanted it lower than 1000 and that's in green, which the, is... The, the yellow is where they agree. The green is where it just takes attorneys. Right. The attorney okay, general so wants no, no maximum. Or a lower maximum. No, we want a lower maximum. So... Okay, state's attorneys want so a thousand. A thousand. Okay. They would want something around along the lines of a one hundred and fifty or two hundred, something like that. Was the original proposal? One hundred and fifty dollars. Right. Two hundred dollars. One hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars. They want. Right. I'll pick a number. Okay. I'll pick two hundred. That's fine. Right. So if we were going in between, it would be seven fifty. Well, let's go seven fifty. And no, no, I, I just said, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happened to me. I think I'm still trying to figure out the eggs. <laughs> the birds that have been. Feathers I, colored. I know. I think that's. That okay, nuts. So go ahead. Uh, okay, so the, se the second portion um, uh, relates to this idea that we're eliminating. Um, ensure his or her appearance and substituting mitigate the risk of flight from prosecution. Um, the Attorney General's office <coughs> and our office agree, I believe, that um, unexcused non appearances should be the basis for imposing bail, and that by making this change, there's a risk that a judge might think that an unexcused non appearance might never be the basis for imposing bail. So, our suggestion is either defining flight from prosecution, which you'll see under subsection C, um, which, you know, we suggest the language, it could be anything uh, we, we want, but uh, the idea that any action or behavior to avoid court processes. Um, alternatively, um, you could put the word or um, after ensure his or her appearance at future proceedings or mitigate the risk of flight from prosecution. Just so that it's clear that uh, non-appearances for good cause should be excused, but that non-appearances um, that are kind of unexcused should be the basis for imposing bail. That's our position. Why don't, why don't we like simply say non-appearance for good cause instead of trying to do something that nobody can understand? I actually like the definition. Having a definition of that. Any, okay, any action? I ran the definition by Judge Grierson, and he said that that makes sense to him. Okay. As well. So, going to, so are there questions about section one? Section one? Okay. Well, the whole, the, well, those three changes are all part of section one. The only question is what was the amount decided on on number two? Right, but I, I, Other than that, we're not you deciding that. We're, okay. We get to mark up later. Okay. Um, we yep. can reject them. But right okay. now, this is a proposal from the state's attorneys. Yep. Good. I thought we could hear from, hear from yep. Good. anyone else who wants to speak on these proposals and then do our markup. But okay. I'm, I'm not feeling real rushed on this. Um, okay. But I wanted, are we done with section one? And we'll come back to it. I want to hear what others think about it. Section two. Okay, so section two relates to the idea that um, it's changing the rules of criminal procedure to um, require that a law enforcement officer who's making an after-hour arrest consult with a state's attorney, um, and then the state's attorney shall contact the, ju the judge. Um, and now I think that um, I think that Erica Marthage, I wasn't in the room, but I, I think she yeah, testified. She said that police officer would contact. Uh, he, exactly. I think she said that, you know, the, the law enforcement officer's on the scene. He'll be able to answer any sort of questions that come up. And she said that if she was required 
to call the judge, she would probably just conference in the law enforcement officer because he's the one that, so I changed that section um, that just, How do you remember that? that basically forces the law enforcement officer to consult with the uh, state's attorney, the on-call state's attorney, prior to calling the judicial officer, but not requiring the state's attorney to actually call. Um, My uh, note on that, I don't know if Alice, you got something different, but America wanted, or a law enforcement officer added to prosecuting attorney, and she said she already does this herself. It's not a problem. She should not make a call, however, in situations where a case is already pending. Therefore, she wanted the law enforcement officer added to the war. Right. In case she had a case pending with the person, it could be another matter. Right. She didn't want to have any ex parte conversation with the judge, I thought. This proposal by James is eliminating her own. So, I, so I, well, eliminating her from calling a judicial arrest. So, the, all the, America says she does now. Right. Yeah. So, the alternative could be and the prosecuting attorney or the law enforcement officer shall yeah. contact the judicial officer. So that's fine with us, too. Um, I would... Yeah, were... And then we also... Ren, I'm sorry, I told you. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. We both need more What's the, uh, what's the uh, penalty for cruelty to a child? I emailed you already. Um, we also uh, suggested eliminating the affidavit requirement. Um, we recognize that uh, we recognize the intent behind having an affidavit. Affidavits are required in search warrants. Um, they're required in other circumstances. This, um, however, we do think that this will. Uh, have the consequence of people being held for hours while uh, officers preparing an affidavit and potentially the on-call state's attorney will have, then have to review the affidavit and um, it adds, a, it adds a, a pretty big step into the process. Um, and and um, I would, I, I mean, I, I should just note here that this section does create a new Obligation on the state's attorneys, um, especially the on-call state's attorneys. Well, I think it's a good one. It, uh, yeah, I I have just a few numbers from this past weekend. Because Chittenden County, I know Erica does this already in Bennington, but Chittenden County is kind of its own separate thing. Um, you know, the, over the weekend they had uh, 11 lodgings, one flash site, so that would be 12 additional calls that the on-call state's attorney would be taking, in addition to the. Uh, five calls that they already took in the three hours of work that they put in um, for those five calls. So just I've, and the, the the week before they had 23 lodgings, so they would be called in a, in every one of those circumstances too. I used to do on call. Yeah. I don't get paid. <laughs> Early on, right? Me too. You're Me too. After I wake up, right? Get woken up by a drunk person. Uh, once, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of fun. That's a funny story. Especially when the officer who calls you says, I have a defendant here who specifically asked for you. And you get put on with a guy and he says, I never asked for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it starts. <laughs> the other question, is the officer within earshot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, go ahead. 
Okay, uh, my next change is the highlighted section on page three of my amendment. Um, That's so, the, uh, so this goes back to the idea that um, judges may consider non-appearances or shall consider non-appearances yeah. when, when making uh, bail determinations. Um, moving on to page four. So um, this is that old place of abode. Place of abode. So uh, we, you and the you and the attorney generals are starting to agree on housing. Right. I I don't I think that's right. I mean, uh, we're I think we're willing to accept uh, removing place of abode restrictions when you're talking about securing appearance. But when you're talking about protecting the public, we strongly oppose limiting a judge's authority or discretion to make place of abode um, restrictions. Uh, we'd very much like to see that go back in when you're talking particularly about protecting the public. Um, you know, the court's only allowed to impose a place of abode restriction if it's part of the least restrictive means to ensure public safety. I did a Westlaw search um, on place of abode restrictions and to the best of my knowledge, it's only ever been challenged one time, um, and the court vacated that condition. So the process, you know, I think that the process is working, and um, these are being used appropriately. Um, and then the last change that I have is um, in reviewing conditions of release. Currently, a defendant who's being detained um, may seek a change in conditions of release and, and the hearing will happen within 48 hours, the review will happen. We'd just like to say that if there's a material change of circumstances that the state's attorneys be afforded the same 48-hour uh, review. All right, that's the review changes. Uh, yep. David, do you wanna speak on behalf of the sure. attorney general positions? And then I'll ask others if they want to speak, and then I'll, and AJ, if you want to speak to your letter, we'll hear from you as well regarding the testimony from the Lutman Regional Hospital. Judge, they seem welcome, obviously. Great in on this. Uh, for, the, for the record, <clears throat> David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. I'll just comment, I'll limit my comments to the green part okay. since that's where we disagree, but obviously I'm happy to answer questions about any aspect of it. So turning to page two of uh, the state's attorney's proposal and uh, talking about the maximum amount, uh, we've always been okay with having some amount of low amount of bail imposed. I think for purely administrative purposes, it, and allowing those administrative processes to happen, I think it might be necessary to be able to impose a small amount of bail, especially in the um, issuance of arrest warrant context. However, we think it's very important that that amount be low. And so the House Judiciary uh, Committee started with a $200 number, uh, which admittedly was, um, you know, I think somewhat arbitrary, but the key thing is making sure that, or from our standpoint, the key thing is making sure that, that number is below $500 at least, and arguably, you know, $100 or $200 would be ideal. And the key thing here is just making sure that for these lower level misdemeanors, I think it's often a sort of reflexive request that they be, that bail be set at $500. That's oftentimes, I think, when you sit in criminal court, you see that as a, a standard number that's considered a pretty minimal number, but as a matter of reality, that's a very difficult amount for many people to reach. And so setting it low um, at $100, $200 seems like, uh, or we believe is an important step forward. $1,000 is pretty high. It's above what the minimum often, is, or what's currently used as the minimum right now as a sort of reflexive default. Um, and so we're not sure that that would we don't believe that that would have much effect, and it's important to set that well uh, for that for those expungement eligible misdemeanors. So, so we're okay with having some amount to allow administrative processes to work, uh, but we think that amount should be low. So, can I ask a question? Yep. So, is there a, a minimum amount, Do you, or don't you care about that? Is that okay? Judge decides twenty bucks. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's our pitch on that. We'd ask for $100, $200, somewhere in that neighborhood. 
Um, turning to the next section, subsection three, we, we are fine with adding a definition to clarify that we're really talking about the willful avoidance of court process. I think that's always been our understanding of what mitigate the risk of flight means. We wouldn't want to um, leave in the language about ensuring appearance because, again, that's capturing a set of circumstances that really doesn't have, that doesn't necessarily have to do with the willful avoidance of court process. That captures a bunch of circumstances that low-income defendants often find themselves in in terms of inability to get to court for a whole variety of reasons around transportation issues, child care issues, uh, job issues, um, problems with notification, things like that. So we want the part of the point of this is let's uh, move away. Let, let's pull out all those things that are really just the circumstances of being a low income individual out of the judicial weighing and make sure we're really focused on what we're worried about, which is people who are trying to avoid court process. And we fully acknowledge that is something that we need to, courts need to have the tools to deal with. And so mitigating the risk of flight from prosecution, we think, is the way to do that. Uh, with a definition that's either the one proposed here or something similar, we think, is a, a smart clarification. You're talking about saying willful action or behavior to avoid court processes. I was thinking myself of oh. somebody who's decided to enter into a treatment program, um, and they're obviously not in court because of that presidential treatment program. And I, I, I don't know if that is the same thought process you're having at this point. Um, I, so, your and your question would be: Would that fall within? The would that fall uh, the way I'm reading it right now? It's any action or behavior to avoid mm -hmm. court process. So, if I enter into it voluntary treatment, residential treatment facility, technically I'm in violation of that definition as I'm mm -hmm. reading it and also missing something there. I don't think Possibly. that's the kind of I situation we want to have um, violating this particular provision. Right. I, think, I definitely agree with you on that. I don't think that's the type of behavior we're trying to capture here. I think you know, if it's a, if it, if somebody's genu entering a, pro a treatment program like that, um, I think it's reasonable argument that they're not doing it for the purpose of avoiding court process, even if uh, it creates conflicts with court appointments. But, so, yeah, that would be my initial thought on it. But I, I see the issue as something that we can perhaps try to write around. Um, turning to, and then so back to the old place of a vote argument, which we've, we've had and discussed. This is on page four. Um, again, the place of abode condition is an especially powerful condition in that when it's imposed, if an individual can't meet it, and, and usually it's just stepping back for a second as a practical matter, what that usually means is uh, prosecution asks for it, judge will say, uh, okay, we're going to limit your place of abode. Maybe you can't live where you've been living and you need to have somebody else come in and be able to state to the court that you're going to be somewhere else and they can attest to the fact that you're going to be somewhere else uh, and that they're letting you stay there and they will report to the court if you're if you're violating conditions of release or they're willing to report to the court if you're violating conditions of release and that often has the very real consequence of holding somebody because they cannot meet the condition of release and it may not even be that they're held on bail in that circumstance they would just be held because they can't meet the conditions of release uh, so it's a it's a one of the more powerful conditions of release in that it's very consequential, and I think it's often, I, I think the way that defendants and defense attorneys deal with it is usually to pretty rapidly find a place where they can go as best they can, and have that person come in and testify. But that will still potentially mean that they're being held for a night or two or three nights while they're getting a witness who can come in and testify. So it does have the consequence of having somebody be held. Um, we think it's very reasonable, given that, to say, sure, for public safety reasons, of course, that this should be necessary. Uh, so we think that the definition and, and proposed definition on sub subsection B uh, has enough carve-outs for the crimes that deal with uh, danger to the public or danger to a specific individual to protect public safety. So we think it's a reasonable middle, middle ground 
making sure that people aren't being held where there's not really a public safety concern um, or the place of abode isn't being imposed, but allowing it to be used where necessary. Yeah, can I just ask a question that may not yeah. be? Um, so with regard to, you're talking about the person to come in and testify. Are you talking about the person who will house the person? That's right, generally speaking. Okay, so last night, believe it or not, I got a call from a grandfather who has at his house a 17-year-old who was charged with, I don't know what the exact, exact charge, it hit his mother, who doesn't live with this. In other words, this is the grandfather and the father of the mother. Anyway, he says his, you know, his grandson hit, hit his mother, and he agreed to take him into his house. All well and good. But then, um, and he somehow the paperwork, who knows what's true and not true, but three different times he was asked by the police to keep signing a statement. Um, one time they said they filed it too late, another one they couldn't find it, and asking them to come to court on three different occasions. So he's pretty pissed off about having to sign this and nobody knows. And then the court had called him and said, you've got to be here tomorrow. And so he's like, well, why would I get arrested? The grandfather. Yeah. He goes, they told me I'm going to be arrested if, if I don't get him there. So he goes, why would I get arrested? Here I'm trying to do something good here. So anyway, he's the witness that they're looking for then. Okay, I get it. Did he sign anything? He had signed at least twice to, that he would get the kid there. And each time it got screwed up and they said, no, he didn't have to be there. And now there's a third time. And he's not wanting to sign anything else. He's scared now. They still told him he would get arrested. So, but that's the witness that you're looking for. Who would yes, that say, is an example of okay. the witness we'd be talking about here. And I can't, okay. I, you know, I don't want to speculate on that particular no, 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 circumstance. No, no, no. Generally, yes, that's the idea. And in that particular crime, I would imagine would be charged as, as a domestic, a domestic assault based on yeah, your description. Right. I'm yeah. not certain, but that would actually that would fall within the uh, list here. of crimes yeah. that would be allowed to place a restriction okay. under this proposal. Well, it's probably a good idea. It's a kid fighting with his mother, hits her. <coughs> yeah. So what you're saying is that if you take out place of abode there on the top, that there are enough um, provisions that relate to protecting the public for the safety of the public, that if that were necessary, to, if it were necessary to put a place of abode condition on there, it could be done under those other under the uh, protection of the public. Yeah, well, is that be, what you're saying? it would be done specifically under subdivision G, which is in this version crossed out by on the state's attorney's proposal. And we're saying that if you take out place of abode in subdivision B and add subdivision G set instead, mm -hmm. that that would allow for um, sufficient tools as I described, for the protection of the public. So that's the specific proposal. Okay. I'm sorry, I got this. Oh, no, it's fine. Just a minute. Are you put Section G back in. You have that's Section right. G. That's yeah. right. But that would cover that. That's, that's our contention, yes. Peggy, education? Just, just take that situation with the guy last night. Okay. So. That's not a listed crime, right? His crime, a getting domestic, his mother, a domestic. A, if it was charged as a domestic, that is a listed crime. It is a listed crime. Including this misdemeanor domestic. So, um, just to be clear, you, you think you can take out place of abode and still provide for adequate restrictions? Under this proposal, which does allow for the place of abode restriction under subdivision G. So it's not entirely taking it out. It's just limiting the, the, limiting the categories of crimes in which it can be used. Uh, uh, so for which, leaving it in or taking it out? I'd leave it in. I'd leave it in. And yeah, I mean, in our, propo yeah, our proposal is to leave it in in, in part. Well, I understand that, but I'd leave it in on B. I'm trying to, the, the state's attorneys want to unstrike G, I know, I think their proposal is to say, forget about G, we don't need it because we're going to have a place of vote in B. Your proposal, is that correct? 
Our proposal would be to unstrike place of abode, and then you could, you know, G was added, G, G was added to kind of give place of abode restrictions in certain circumstances. So now we would just say place of abode can be restricted. We don't need G anymore. Exactly. That's right. It's a one or the other proposal what between okay. us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, That's all on, but I can answer any so questions. Now, if, and the, on the, um, okay, so the rest of it you both agreed to. That's right. Okay. Are there any other questions for David at this point? So, um, Judge Grierson, do you have any comments on the proposal from the state's attorneys, or do you have any comments on the House bill, or whatever you want to do? Okay. Happy to hear from you. All right, thank you. Hi, Judge Pearson. Try not to confuse us today. Well, I'm already confused sitting back there, so I'll, hopefully I won't confuse you okay. any more than I already am. Um, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, let me at least start with the proposals that I understand from the state's attorney's office. Um, Let me go back for a minute. In in the uh, House Judiciary, when we testified about this issue surrounding risk of flight versus non-appearance, one of the suggestions I had made that uh, I think was in a draft at one time or another was to make it an alternative. In other words, keep the language non-appearance or risk of flight. Uh, I would still in, encourage that, um, but uh, I would also, if that's not going to happen, then support the uh, state's attorney's proposal to define risk of flight. His yeah, flight. That was why the de definition was there. We, I had a note to define that rather than. So I would suggest either in, continue to have non appearance as it presently exists or risk of flight and then define risk of flight. Um, I have uh, been convinced after talking with judges uh, this idea of having the um, state's attorney call the judge. Um, I've had a considerable discussion with the judges and we would support uh, the language proposed by the uh, state's attorney that um, they would contact, the, the police would contact the state's attorney um, before contacting the judge and still allow law enforcement. So there'd still be that consultation, yeah. but the state's attorney would. So we support uh, that change. Is it, uh, can I just clarify, yes. do you care whether it's either of them or can both of them call you after they consult with each other? No, either either one could, but we, at a minimum, we would want to make sure that the police have consulted with their right. state's attorney before they call us. But if the state's attorney chooses to call, that's uh, obviously okay. appropriate. I, my argument had been that we're dealing with conditions of release or bail, and that's more properly a discussion between the state's attorney as opposed to police. But I, as I said, I've talked with a number of judges, and we can live with this language. But it wouldn't preclude the state's attorney from calling. Um, um, my, the, the judge may never get called. That's true. If, um, if they can solve The state's with, attorney might say, well, look. The, this, this is not a bail. This happened four months ago. The alleged incident has happened four months ago. If they had no restrictions on the individual, why would we put them on that? Exactly. And they may decide that they don't, or they're not seeking right. monetary bail. But if you remember uh, for, for two, I believe, we had made one uh, qualification, that is, if it's domestic violence, they will call for at least right. four conditions of release. So we're in support of that. Um, I, I, do, I, quite frankly, have never really understood the concern about uh, leaving the restrictions on including place of abode um, as proposed by the state's attorneys uh, because I, I have not it has not been my experience that that condition has been abused or there's been a claim that it's been abused and um, there are situations um, where apart from the conditions uh, in, in section G as proposed by the Attorney General's office, um, a situation where, for instance, a drug dealer living next to a school uh, would not fall under a, a listed crime, but you may not want them to no longer live there. And, and I just don't see the need to restrict our discretion in that regard, absent you know, some claim that we have a pattern of abusing it. Um, 
I would also support uh, under their review of conditions uh, the state following the material change in circumstances giving them that authority and going back uh, uh, my confusion was under the first page of the state's attorney's proposal where it talks about limitation on imposition of appearance bonds mm -hmm. Um, and going on to the top of page two, uh, because I think what's happened, they've gone back to the language that was in the bill as introduced, and I was looking at as passed, and I recognize that the bill as passed, if you look at page, the top of page two as passed, that section, I would agree, is not clear. The idea was not to prohibit um, a request for monetary bail, um, it, it could be read as passed, um, that bail could not be imposed or requested upon the temporary release of a person pursuant to Rule 5. I think the language that needs to, to qualify that or clarify that would be if either the temporary release of a person pursuant to Rule 5B or at the initial appearance of a person. In other words, both of them should be qualified by eligibility for expungement, and then that would not, um, that would seemingly clarify that provision. The state's attorney's proposal going back to the original uh, language would also seem to clarify that. The court takes no position on whether you have a maximum amount of bail, whether it's 200 or $1,000. That's clearly a policy question. Um, I'll take bail for hundred dollars. <clears throat> we want to be clear that um, we do are not precluded from setting bail um, when it uh, call is made for temporary release. And I think Sure. Do you have any uh, position on the request that we either provide you with information in an affidavit or a sworn statement or not? The source of that is the fact that if a person is going to be lodged, the police have to file an affidavit when they lodge the person. Mm -hmm. But I recognize that if um, the police are going to contact the state's attorney um, that there may be a delay. They're not going to know until after they consult with the judge as to whether or not bail is going to be set. So um, again, I guess I've been convinced that uh, it's not necessary, although my concern is that there is no record of what we based a bail decision on the night before. That was the reason for requesting the affidavit. So do you prefer the House as passed language, or do you prefer the state's attorney's proposal? I, I'm, I'm content with the state's attorney's proposal as far as it goes with respect to having the police call the state's attorney. There are some judges, I will tell you, that feel that having that affidavit is important <coughs> to have a record of what they base their decision on. So I would uh, encourage the committee to strongly consider that. I understand the downside of that request because of the time involved. But that is the only record. There, otherwise, there is no record of, of the basis for the decision. And that sometimes changes overnight. By the time we get into court, there may be a different charge in front of us. And that was the reason for it. So I think it's important. Um, many judges do. Okay. Um, the other issue uh, that came up in last week's testimony, but I haven't seen any proposal, we spent a considerable amount of time in the House Judiciary talking about the ability of someone to pay bail. And the, the bill is passed, calls for us to consider uh, that issue, but not hold a separate hearing on the ability to pay. Um, and 
we certainly would not want to see that hearing if it you and I'm not sure if, if the ACLU is still advocating for that type of hearing but the, the problems we saw were uh, who has the burden of proof uh, to show whether someone has the ability to pay is it the state's attorney uh, having to prove that they have the ability to pay or the defense coming in um, and we would not hold that hearing during an arraignment proceeding otherwise uh, we would never get through the day so I, I am, would urge the committee to accept the language in the bill as passed which allows us to consider it um, but not hold a separate hearing on that issue you know where that is. Uh, it is. <clears throat> it's on page four under section D. The language was added to the current statute to say, upon consideration of the defendant's financial means. Um, and essentially, what that would amount to, and I don't know that I have them here today, all we receive on day of arraignment is a request for signed counsel. It's a, uh, at best a one page affidavit. So you'd like that back in? We would like to keep that uh, as consideration without the necessity of having a hearing. Right. So as passed, uh, we, can, uh, we can live with that. We can consider it. That's, that's our position as well. Okay, we can add that back to the... What? I think they just want to keep it as uh, as, 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 as there, there may have been a proposal by the ACLU to um, create a separate hearing. There was. And, oh, and but I don't know. That's not how it passed the house, so it's not what's in the house. Well, we can hear from the ACLU right after we hear from the judge. There's the judge. You want it in. I'm satisfied with the language as passed. What I the do house. not, yes. I do, do not want a separate hearing. I do not want a separate hearing. Because you'd never get out of the day. We'd never get out of the day. And what it would really require, in, in my view, is once we've set bail, if the defendant then feels that well, he does We could also determine whether it is a public defender at that hearing, too. Well, that we're, we're, we have adjusted to that process. It's a whole separate uh, proceeding if you're determining ability to pay. It's a whole separate <clears throat> issue. And it would really require, if we set bail, for the defendant to then say, I can't afford this, have them file a motion and have a hearing at a later date on the ability. And that's that's why we'd like to stay away from that. Um, and I believe those are all the comments. Does everybody understand the judge? I think so. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Chloe, did you want to comment? Um, always have to get up um, for the record Chloe White ACLU uh, so this is I just saw this for the first time um, about 10 minutes ago uh, we very disappointed about uh, the thousand dollar max I mean the point of this is you know for comparison you have two people who committed the same crime let's say shoplift they both shoplifted you know two hundred dollars worth of goods one person can get one person has money and is able to get out of jail and to pay bail and get out the other one can't I mean this is really we're trying to look at you know disparities here and trying to fix those disparities I mean thousand dollars that's a that's a high bar I worry that also putting a thousand dollars into statute um, might lead more judges to then start setting things at a thousand dollars even though it's a max rather than right now as the attorney general's office has said um you know the 200 300 dollars which is the normal practice um we would prefer for the bill to stay as is with no bail um you know but you know we, we certainly would oppose a thousand dollars max that's that's very high um you know i i think also Flight from prosecution, um, what the AG's office and the state's attorneys talked about seems all right, although I wouldn't mind putting in, um, you know, unfortunately splitting an infinitive, but to intentionally avoid or avoid intentionally uh, court processes. Um, I think 
on page three where it says considering not appearance it's we're supposed to consider not appearances when considering bail I again would want to emphasize that we wouldn't I think considering non appearances that are um, I would say not willful attempts to avoid court processes would be a mistake um, so ensuring that they're just that considering they're just considering the ones where there was a willful uh, flight from prosecution um, would would be better um, and we support the AG's office on the place of abode restrictions um, you know it, personally I would rather the bill as is and you know uh, than, than this thousand dollar max um, regarding what Judge Gerson said um, I don't know if we've ever proposed a separate hearing although um, you know, we would, you know, in, in ideal circumstances, like a, uh, you know, like a thing in in, in statute, in trying to statute, say you cannot impose bail that is uh, that someone cannot afford. But uh, you know, I understand that not wanting to have a separate hearing. I think something on the record saying, you know, we determined even from this one page affidavit for assigned counsel that this person could afford or can't afford might be just written on the record might be uh, useful, especially because it says the statute, they must consider uh, financial circumstances. So having a record of that required consideration oh. might be good. But I don't, you know, I, I don't think we're gonna, I don't think a uh, separate hearing is going to be uh, something that is successful here. Okay. Um, but thank you, I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Senator. So, um, as you might have guessed, uh, we oppose the changes, which hopefully is all of them. Or? Well, we'll go through them one at a time. I think I think it's all of them, um, but we'll see if there's we'll see if there's one in there that I missed. Um, so I'll start on I'll start on page two with uh, at the top of the page. This um, it's, it's subsection two under seven five seventy five fifty one B sub two, um, which is the in statement of a thousand dollar maximum for the expungeable crimes. Now, frankly, if you put that in there, um, you know, I think as a practical matter, you're just making no change at all. Uh, right now, for those crimes that are expungement eligible, it's not likely that people are seeing bail post uh, bail set at more than a thousand dollars, you know, in the cases that I have had recently that I've done arraignments, I haven't seen anybody getting more than a thousand, or you know, getting more than a thousand dollars set for an expungement eligible offense. Um, that does not, however, mean that there's a whole class of people out there who have bail set that they are able to reach. There's a lot of people who cannot afford a thousand dollars bail. They can't afford two hundred dollars bail. They can't afford five hundred dollars bail. Um, it's a you know, frankly, and frankly, you know, as a, as a matter of practicality also, $1,000 is an interesting number because at least in Vermont, um, that's the lowest that you can get a bail bondsman to post bail for. So anything under, so, so just to, by way of example, if a judge sets bail at $1,000, um, with a $100 deposit to a bail bondsman, you can get a $1,000 bail posted. If the judge sets bail at $800, which is less than $1,000, you can't get bail posted by a bail bondsman, and therefore you've got to find a way to come up with eight hundred dollars, which is um, now there's a difference there, which is if you post an entire eight hundred dollar deposit and you don't and you appear for trial and submit to sentencing, you get your eight hundred dollars back. You don't get your hundred dollars back from the bail bondsman who posted your bail. Um, but at the you know at the end of the day, as far as a barrier of affordability goes. If you set this cap, we're really just not going to change anything about the status quo. Uh, I think that it's important to recognize that even low low bail. So you know the the AG's office is talking about two hundred, five hundred dollars. Uh, the state's attorneys want to see a thousand dollars, and I agree that that's it, it's good to see the uh, state prosecution offices moving in the direction of wanting to. Um, see in statute a, a low bail requirement rather than our current sort of open-ended requirement. 
but at the end of the day, as far as a practical matter goes, it's not going to affect the thing. Um, the same people who are currently being held for lack of very small amounts of bail are going to continue to be held for lack of very small amounts of bail. Um, and, you know, once we get up over $1,000, that's more in line with, um, you know, we're not seeing that imposed in these types of cases anyway. And I think that brings to sort of point number two about this $1,000 bail, which is that, um, you know, frankly, from my perspective, setting bail at $1,000 or $200 or $500 is really, um, you know, legally meaningless because the only reason we set bail is to say we want you to appear for trial. The idea being that if you um, have a substantial amount of money sort of in hock somewhere, that it, you are going to want to uh, appear for your trial because you don't want to be out that money. Now, so it's it's a you know it, it it's a balancing thing that we presume that defendants do. That a defendant says, "Man, I would totally like flee and avoid this trial," and you know, except that, man, I want that I want that money back. Now, even my most indigent clients, and I have like the most indigent clients you can have, none of them have ever, you know, and I feel fairly safe saying this, none of them have ever said like, man, I would totally flee and avoid trial, but I want that $250 back, and I guess if that means going to trial, I'll stick around so that I get my $250 back. <laughs> it's, we're talking about, it's really, that's not the decision people are making, but the framework that the AGs and state's attorneys are asking for pretends that that's the decision that people make. And so really what it is, is it's not a sort of legitimate request for, you know, a money deposit to ensure that somebody appears at trial. What it is, it, when you set $200 bail on someone, is it is, you know, basically saying, if you don't have $200, you're going to go to jail. It has nothing to do with insuring appearance or not insuring appearance when you're talking about $200. Um, and it doesn't, you know, for that matter, it doesn't have to do with that when you're talking about $1,000. Like, I used 200 as an example, but likewise, you know, there's not a lot of people out there who are saying, man, I would totally, I would totally avoid this whole court process, but for I want that $1,000 back. Um, it's, it's... Is it usually their money? Often it is, and if it's not, it's often relatives or someone who... <clears throat> Do they care about it? and that's you know or don't care or don't care about it. Um, but so that's that's to begin with that's why we would oppose that as far as the definition of flight from prosecution we think that's just unnecessary and if you include it it's not legally meaningful because flight from prosecution is a constitutional term it appears it's gone back to Stack v Boyle and United States v Salerno. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court has refused to define it. They, they say we're not going to we're not going to say here is what flight from prosecution means. Instead, what they say is they go through and they just it's a fact by fact, a case by case factual analysis. So circuit courts look at a case and they make a factual determination about you know is this evidence of uh, risk of flight or is it not? Um, you know I don't think this is a terrible definition, but at the end of the day it doesn't matter because. What really defines the question is how the how the how the courts interpret the, the language that appears in uh, federal constitutional cases that have interpreted the Eighth Amendment and bail provisions around that. And you know, like I said, there's no definition we can turn to. They haven't provided us with one. Instead, it's kind of like due process. If you were to write into a statute, you know, in in the in the last section, the word due process shall mean blah blah blah. That's not really meaningful because due process is a constitutional concept, and what matters is not how it's defined in statute, but how it's been interpreted and applied by the courts. And so you can put any definition you want in statute, but at the end of the day, it's what the Constitution means that matters. Um, so, so does it, it won't hurt anything to have it in there? You know, I think it adds confusion. We end up in arguments about um, the constitutional constitutional applications of the word words risk of flight, which is what appears in Stack v. Boyle, it's what appears in United States v. Salerno, um, versus the statutory definition that didn't really have a, a legal basis for it. It wasn't something that where somebody was like, you know, pointing at a pointing at a particular case and saying, ah, here's where we got that definition from. Um, but well, I mean like a, you know, 
So all it's, lawyers will know, or do you still have to argue? Oh, well, I don't know about all lawyers, but <laughs> public defenders will know. Um, we do transfer. We have good transfer. Um, so moving on to the issue of the judges making phone calls versus the police making phone calls. Um, you know, frankly, we think it would be better if the judges are the ones contact, or the, I'm mean, sorry, the prosecutors, not the police, are the ones contacting judges uh, for the setting of after hours bail. We think that's important for the, you know, for the same reason that it was part of the House passed bill, which is to say that um, there was recognition in there that the officers on the scene uh, very likely have a different perspective on the case than the prosecuting attorney does, and that it's important to have an attorney make the decision about what the state's request is going to be, not the prosecution. As far as there being some problem with ex parte contact because a prosecutor makes the call rather than a cop, I, you know, frankly, I just don't buy that at all because if there's a problem with ex parte uh, communication, it would be a problem if a cop consults with a prosecutor and then talks to the judge just as much as if the prosecutor talked to the judge on their own. Um, you know, we've got a lot of cases and an ethical rule that say that when there is a third party, like a, like a cop, who is connected with one of the parties in the case, in this case the prosecution, um, that you, you are violating the rules of uh, professional conduct whether you do something wrong, which you know the presumption here is that an ex parte phone call about bail would be wrong, which I don't actually buy, but if that were the case, it would be just as wrong for a cop to do it in consultation with a prosecutor as it would be for a prosecutor to do it. Um, because it's incumbent on uh, all of us who are lawyers to ensure that anyone who is working in our direction isn't doing anything uh, that violates the ethical rules. Um, so. Frankly, I think this is uh, a question that if, if, it, if it were true that it was a problem for prosecutors to make a phone call to a judge, then it would also be true that it would be a problem for cops to, in consultation with a prosecutor, make a phone call to a judge. So, you know, we think it would be better for the prosecution to be making these decisions and making these calls, not the, not the cop, and we don't think that this has really has any effect on any sort of anyone's ethical obligations or anything like it. Um, <clears throat> about the affidavit. Oh, and the affidavit again. You know, as was said before, if, if someone's going to be lodged, an affidavit has to be filed anyway. And we think it's important for there to be a record of how these uh, after-hours bail decisions are made. Right now, um, you know, it's not a recorded phone call. It's not, it, it limits the ability of anyone to see how a decision was made, and it's important to have that record. Um, and so we think that, have, that the affidavit requirement is important um, just for that reason. And if, it, if we were not to have that, then I think what we would suggest, if there wasn't going to be an affidavit requirement, it would be some other way to create a record of the proceeding. Um, what that looked like, I think, you know, if, if if the idea was we're gonna we're gonna get rid of the affidavit requirement and we want you to come up with some other way to create a record, I'd have to think on what that would look like. But um, whether it means getting some kind of a written decision, getting some kind of a recorded decision, getting some kind of a uh, audio recording of the of the conversation, I'm not sure. That's something I'd have to think about and probably talk with a few of the other people involved in this about about what else could be used uh, sort of in substitution for the affidavit as far as providing some record of the reasoning for the decision. Um, so the next one, actually, that might not be a, so this is 7554A1, adding in the, as well as any prior instance in which the person charged avoided court processes. Um, that one, I have to take a closer look at. So this is page three, um, about halfway down the page. And that one, I'm going to have to start and get back to you. We did not get these. Alex, it's on page three of what the state's attorney gave us. Oh, sorry. I was sorry about that. I should have referred to the right copy. That one I'm going to have to get back to the committee on. We've only had this proposal on our hand for about... 10 minutes now, and um, this one I have to look a little bit deeper into. 
So I'm going to skip over that one for now. We would agree with the uh, AG's office regarding place of abode, which is essentially to say keep the as passed language in. Uh, and we would agree with the reasoning of the AG's office on that, which is that there's already enough uh, ways to provide the protection that, uh, that people are looking for without putting in uh, what really is probably the most restrictive <coughs> condition of release you can put in, which is a restraint on where someone can and can't live. Um, and so we'd be, we'd be happy to see that. As far as the last proposal goes, which is including uh, allowing the state to request a bail review, um, we would oppose that. That uh, right now, the defense can request a bail review. The state cannot. That reflects um, a few things. To begin with, it reflects the fact that the state has longer with the case than the uh, defense does. The state has had time to prepare a bail argument at the time of the arraignment. Uh, rule 5 proceeding and arraignment, um, where the defense has not had that time. The defense has, you know, generally just met their client and makes the best argument they can on the basis of the information they can get from their client in the hallway. Um, and that's why there is often a need for a bail review because, um, you know, it's totally different. You, you, may, you can have a totally different outcome at a bail hearing when you have someone available to testify or when you have information that you may not have, um, you know, in that first few minutes of uh, having, your, you know, having a meeting with your client. Um, and I think also it just leans in the wrong direction. The point of this bill was to reduce the number of people that we are holding on bail um, and to try to free up some of those beds that are currently occupied by the detainee population. Um, and I think that allowing the state to move for modification, um, which would presumably be used in cases where someone is not held and they seek to, after the initial decision to have the person not held, to then have them held, um, really just gives them two bites at the apple uh, and is kind of contrary to the purpose of the bill itself. And that gets to the end. And I'm happy to answer any questions or just sit down. Any questions? Thank you. Hey, hey, do you want to call that? Sure, sure. Maybe not on this, but I'll let you sign some other on it. Or whatever you want to talk about. Okay, I'll take that as an opening. My name is A.J. Rubin. Oh, I'm, I'm an attorney at Disability Rights Vermont. We are your mental health ombuds people. Right. Uh, my staff uh, does a lot of work with um, criminal defendants when they wind up in prison, um, and we're contacted a lot by folks with disabilities who are in the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm here mostly today to respond to um, John Wallace's uh, submission on April 4th to this committee regarding this bill. Um, he culminates his, uh, his uh, statement with a request that there be an amendment that um, would seek to um, reiterate or actually create a new right of a court to um, put someone in prison for the purpose of getting a psychiatric evaluation. That's not the current law, and that would, we would believe that would be constitutionally infirm. Um, Mr. Wallace was um, apparently very confused when he wrote this. Um, the law is that um, people are uh, only uh, held in emergency departments uh, pending a psychiatric inpatient um, stay if the doctors think they're too sick to be released. And bail really has nothing to do with it. Um, if bail is imposed on a criminal defendant and the court also orders the person be evaluated in a hospital but there's no bed, that results in the person going to prison without adequate mental health treatment until a bed is open. Um, I believe Dr. Uh, Judge Grierson has been working on solving that problem, um, but the problem that Mr. Wallace raises is simply not, does not exist. Uh, there's nobody who's being detained at an emergency department because of a criminal proceeding. If they're being detained at an emergency department, it's because they're too ill to be released and there's no bed. Um, so I thought that was really important to identify that um, the folks uh, who need mental health care are not really an issue uh, in this bail reform. Um, I would take the opportunity to say, though. Before you do. Yes, sir. You're, you're saying that 
problem of people being held in emergency rooms is not one of correct, is not one of criminal activity, but rather because there's a lack of space in a mental health facility. Yes, sir. If a person who's, who's um, being charged with a crime is before the judge, and the judge wants to have a mental health evaluation, that person could be held or could be released, where would they go? Right, so the, the confusion that Mr. Wallace had was that the statute says that a court can order a mental health competency evaluation for a defendant to be either in a correctional facility or in a mental health hospital. The, what Mr. Wallace didn't get was that the judge can only order the person go to a hospital if a screener says they need inpatient treatment. So, uh, so if you're bailed, you get the evaluation. Is it possible that they would go to the Rutland emergency room? Or is it so only, people only wind up at the emergency department um, if they are too sick to be released. So a court, a criminal court, never orders a person to be held in the emergency department. That, that never happens. Um, there is the EE process that a civil, which is like a civil procedure, it doesn't involve a court, but there's the, the, the emergency evaluation process. But the bottom line is that a criminal court is never saying you have to go to emergency department and stay there until there's an inpatient bed. What, what the court can do is say you have to have an inpatient evaluation and if there's no bed, it's, it's really not clear what happens. What has been happening is if there's no bed, the court will impose small bail and a person goes to jail until there's a bed open. And we've been litigating about that. And I believe Judge Pearson's trying to stop that. Um, but, but if there's no bail, the person can be held in the emergency department if the doctors think they shouldn't be released because they're not safe. Yeah. So when, when somebody, um, I mean, this isn't related to the bail issue necessarily, but it is. When somebody is in an emergency room in a hospital and they, the judge decides that they need to have an inpatient competency test, right? I mean, they need to have a competency test. So the judge is in criminal court, so there's an arraignment, and the judge says, I think you need an inpatient right. comp. So they're not right. in the emergency department, they're, they're in court. There's a guy or a woman in court who's a defendant, and the judge says, you should be in a hospital for this evaluation. If there's no bed, the judges have been imposing small bail so that they can go to prison before there's a bed. So the people that are languishing in the emergency room are not criminal defendants on bail. They are not. They have they been? <coughs> do they have any criminal charges against them? Often not. You, these are mostly people who have been picked up in the emergency exam statute, where a doctor and an interested person sign a piece of paper, and a policeman can a police person can pick that person up and take them to the hospital. Then they have to be evaluated by a psychiatrist within 24 hours. If that psychiatrist says they really need to be held, they can be held for three days, and then the Department of Mental Health has to file an AIT. But they haven't been charged with anything necessarily. No. They, they, not necessarily. They may have been charged, but if the court didn't impose bail, then they would be free in the street. If the court right. says you have to be in an inpatient hospital um, for evaluation and there's no bed, the practice has been they impose some bail, so they go to jail pending a bed. I know they're trying to stop that practice, but I, I haven't seen that happen. So there's nobody in the emergency room that has been charged with a crime, has been picked up on a criminal charge, but ends up in the emergency room because they're just too sick to leave them on the street. No, that may be true. Okay. I, think, I think what is, what's not happening is there's no judge, criminal no, court no. judge saying that. No. So when that person is there, mm. could they have that competency test then in the hospital, in the emergency room instead of at the retreat? Could they, could somebody administer a competency test in a hospital emergency room? Most of the hospitals now have two or three rooms set aside for mental health patients. So could, could that happen? Theoretically, it could. Practically, that it, it would not happen. And, and sort of this is why. So if a judge believes that someone's competency or sanity is a question, she can order that the person do an outpatient competency evaluation. That, if that person is being held on bail because they're a huge risk of flight, you know, um, 
they, that outpatient eval can happen in prison. So if it can happen in a right. prison cell, it could certainly happen in an emergency department. The fact is that the psychiatrists who do these competency evaluations are in, you know, they're very busy, and it's unlikely they'd be able to respond within a day or two okay. to an emergency department. And these folks who are in the EDs because they're too sick to be released, you know, they, they, they should be going into a psychiatric unit. Right, right, but we don't have, they stepped on good, so we can't put them there because they're, yeah. The, the bottom line, though, yeah. about this is, is that, he's wrong. Yeah. Right. There's no court. There's no right. criminal judge yeah. saying you have to stay in an emergency department. Right. Right. So, right. So I can ask you a question. So just so I understand this, if if there were a bed available, would a judge be able to order the person into, say, the Broward Library without going through the screener? No. The statute currently so says that they could. No, they can't. The, the, they the can't. legislature changed the statute to say you can't order an inpatient. Uh, evaluation unless the screener approves. I think okay, it's 45 so or 4815 G. So the screeners are the control. They are. They are some control. Yes, by, by statute. Um, I, I did just want to really quickly comment. I was a public defender in Welland County for almost 10 years, for, for nine and a half years. Um, my experience, having done criminal defense law, is that the. the the bail, bail statutes are really uh, for what, what Marshall was talking about. Therefore, risk of flight from the jurisdiction. I mean, the idea is that if you're going to leave our jurisdiction, we can't get you back. Bail should not be imposed for nuisance failures to appear. When I was a public defender in Rome, we had people on, on disorderly conduct and unlawful mischief cases who would never appear in court, but they were hanging out at the, at the shopping center. These were not people who should be bailed. These are mostly my clients with some mental health disabilities who just weren't showing up at court, but everyone knew where they were. They can be arrested for failing to appear. You can go grab them, bring them back. But the question is, should they be bailed, should they be held, because, because they're going to flee the jurisdiction? They're not going anywhere. So it's really important that, that bail be uh, focused on people who are not going to stay in the jurisdiction but not be opposed for people who simply are hanging out in the street corner but not showing up. So how about someone says, hey, I wouldn't want to watch my TV show, I'm not going to go there. So you arrest what that you person. Do? So you want them and arrested. You be, be, well, if they don't show up for court, they get arrested. The question is, do you put them in jail, spend all of our money housing them, and cause severe problems with them? Because you know more time spent in jail, the more problems you get. There are other ways to get them in. The other thing I want to say is my clients get held on bail on small amounts of bail. $150, $200, because yeah. they're often on a fixed income. Yeah. And, and these are people who are not going to leave the jurisdiction. So there, there are pretrial workers. There's you know social work to be done. But I don't think we should be filling the jails up with people who are simply hanging out at the street corner but not willing to show up at court. They can be arrested and reminded. But these are not people who are going to leave the jurisdiction. And that's what they should be held for. And I appreciate your time on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't address the testimony last week, and just to follow up, if the committee has five minutes, I can just give you a quick summary of it. Uh, all right. If you got five. Okay, <laughs> then I'll, I'll take five. So the, the way that it works out in the criminal process, if someone comes into court and there's a question of competency, whether it's raised by the court, the state's attorney, the defense attorney, uh, we bring in a screener uh, to do a mental health screening. To the court? To the court. They're brought in. Uh, the only caveat to that is if that person cannot, if the screener is not available within two hours, the court can make the decision. But generally speaking, they're always available. They come into court to do the screening. It's only if that mental health screener says this person needs inpatient. We cannot order an inpatient evaluation unless the screener says you need, this person needs an inpatient evaluation. We then go to the question, uh, as AJ pointed out, the next decision for us is whether or not this person poses a risk of flight. If they do not pose risk of flight and we do not impose monetary bail, there are four designated hospitals by statute that we can direct this person to for an inpatient evaluation. So if we impose bail, if it's a risk of flight, they will get that evaluation in the facility. If we do not impose bail and we release them on conditions, one condition would be you go to the nearest designated hospital, uh, not necessarily for the evaluation. What they do initially is they bring in a psychiatrist to determine whether or not the person, in fact, needs an inpatient evaluation. That's, that's so it's a second review of it's the in, one who's exactly, in court. Exactly, but it's done by a psychiatrist. Now, if that psychiatrist at the hospital says, this person needs 
in fact needs inpatient, then that person is in the Department of Mental Health custody and it's up to them to find a bed. If they say no, this can be done on an outpatient basis. If the judge has done what they're supposed to have done, they will have issued conditions of release that will allow the person to then be released from the hospital into the community. So um, that first uh, evaluation in the hospital is not a competency evaluation. It is only to determine whether or not they in fact need inpatient. I, I just want to be assured that this bill will not exasperate the problem of the hospitals having backups in their emergency rooms. That's, I mean, well, I, if I'm paraphrasing Mr. Wallace's concern, was that we would have additional, because of this bill, would back up the hospital emergency rooms. And, you know, whatever the cause is, and, you know, it's embarrassing to have a legislature, uh, at least the other body, never dealt with that problem this year. You know, putting it off another year in their capital bill. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, Vermont has a problem. We don't have any place for evaluation. We don't have any place to hold folks who are mentally ill. And so some of them are ending up in the correctional system. Some of them are ending up in our emergency rooms. Will this bill exasperate that problem? That's the question. Senator, I don't think it will, but I will qualify that by saying while I was sitting here, I did get an email from the Department of Mental Health with expressing exactly that concern, uh, that this bill would exasperate that issue. And I'm not sure why they feel that way, but I think, and in talking to the state's attorney, if I go back to that uh, section, oh, it's the, I'm looking at the as passed version uh, on the bottom of page one and going on to two. There's some confusion so at the top of page two, there is some, some folks are reading that to say that we cannot impose bail on any person uh, charged with a misdemeanor. That language needs to be clarified. And I will work with uh, both uh, Marshall and, and um, the state's attorneys and the attorney general's office to make sure we clear. That may be where the fear from the Department of Mental Health. So I'll follow up on that email well, and find out more well, about their concerns. Um, if Bryn is in that loop, sure. and Peggy, when you schedule this for next Tuesday, ask the department, whoever you want from the Department of Mental Health uh, to come in and, and make sure we get this, don't exasperate that problem. And I will follow up with that, because that's, that's we'll, exactly We'll take this up again next Tuesday. Uh, committee, is there a particular number for a page? I think that's it. Pardon me? I'm sorry. I, I sent him a note asking if there's a oh. oh. All right. Is there a particular number so Bryn can prepare something? A well, number of questions. On page, thank you. On page, thank you. On page two, um, 25. Into 25. Um, I was thinking a little higher than that. Um, do I hear 500? Yes. No. No. Too hot. I mean, if you're talking about if you're talking about somebody who has a lot of money, it's no problem. Right? No, it's only no because you can't you get can't a bail, get bail bondsman, bondsman for under a thousand dollars. So it's five hundred dollars. If you impose five hundred dollar bail, it's five hundred. They have to come up with. It can be up to. Then you're better off at a thousand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're still up to hundred dollars. <laughs> But they still have to come up with a hundred dollars, which is a lot of money for okay. somebody who lives on the their mother will give it to them. And I don't know that a bail bondsman would write a bond for a thousand at ten percent cost. My understanding is there. Okay. My feeling, your understanding has always been that five thousand is the limit. Okay, so that's five hundred dollars. Anything is below that, between two hundred and twenty-five, twenty-five to two hundred. Two hundred and twenty-five. No, between twenty-five twenty-five dollars and two hundred dollars. Friend, give us proposal A would be two hundred dollars. Proposal B would be a thousand. We'll have to make a decision next Tuesday. Um, and I, I will. Any decisions on a boat? I'm I think going, we should take them out. I'm going with the boats. I'm going with the boats. I'm going without the boats. 
I'll go with the house version. <coughs> with what? With the house version. Okay, so choice A is with a boat, choice B is without a boat. Looks like Senator Rash will be the deciding vote on both of those situations. He is the decider. Yeah, well, hopefully he gets fully immersed in this while he's sick. <laughs>